memorial and so on. And so we were talking about this in Australia, and at the end of the talk, a fella comes up to us, he says, I own Olson Caves. Uh, you know, I run tours through my caves, and we thought he were going to get mad at us for telling him how quickly caves formed and so on. And he said, you know, you're absolutely right. He says, every couple of years I have to go through and knock all the stalactites off the light cords. He said, would you come up and help me understand how this cave really formed so I can tell groups the truth when they come through here? Praise the Lord for that opportunity when we got to do that. Well, that raises some questions about the total amount of time involved in this whole story, doesn't it? <laughs> and that's the one I think a lot of Christians have the most trouble with. Could it really be six ordinary days a few thousand years ago? Isn't the evidence absolutely overwhelming that we just got to believe in millions of years and take a second look at what the Bible says? Well, I signed up for the geophysics course to study firsthand these radioactive decay dating methods. And, and still not really having made up my mind, I was, I was kind of concerned, you know, am I really going to be able to just take the Bible as it seems to, seems to be speaking and so on. And so we went over all these methods, uranium and lead and uh, potassium, argon and so on, rubidium and strontium. And as, after explaining all the methods, the, the professor gave us a problem to calculate the age of a rock based on two sets of data. And he didn't make it up. These were real published information on these rock units and so I with well, the very best of the methods rubidium strontium and so I uh, just calculated the age of the rock calculated the age using the second date one date was nearly ten times bigger than the other ah shucks I thought made another arithmetic mistake like balancing my checkbooks so I went back tried it again tried it again tried it again did stay up past midnight never get the two answers to come out so I'm walking to class the next day, and I ask my friend, did you get that problem to work out? No, I couldn't get it to work. So we all slink into class, kind of feeling bad. The prof is going to get mad at us for not understanding the method. Instead, he just laughed. He said, no, I just want to show you the method doesn't always work. <laughs> we could have tarred and feathered him. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the method may work too well. This is the one that Ken mentioned to you the other day. They took rubidium strontium, dated this lava flow in the bottom of the canyon, very, very old, a billion years. It seemed like with two billion years, something like that. And then Steve Austin, some other creationists, noticed the same kind of lava flow on the top of the canyon. Mm hmm same conditions of crystallization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't we do a date on that? Just see what we get. So they did the date on that. Guess what? The lava flow on the top is a little bit older than the lava flow on the bottom. So if you take radioactive decay dates literally, what? The canyon formed like that, and it formed upside down. <laughs> Something's got to give here. <laughs> Well, the other evening I talked with you about this fossil called Lucy, that back in the 70s this was hailed as another missing link between apes and man. Since then, even evolutionists have realized we found both apes and man below the level where Lucy's found. But at the time, there, uh, when Johansson found Lucy, he wanted it to be older than anything the, the Leakey family had found. The first date he got was a little less than three million years. Aw, oh, shucks, I heard him give the report in San Diego. How disappointed he was. Three months later, the same fellow says, I've got a new date for you, three and a half million years. Johansson says, I'll take it, I'll take it. <laughs> but nobody bothered to ask, why would the second date be any good if the first date actually checked three different ways was wrong? Then another scientist got involved, dated the same volcanic ash, made Lucy even younger than the original date. An editor from Science News interviewed the guy that had done all these wrong dates so far, and he says, what do you think about this scientist that says you were wrong every time you dated Lucy? His snappy reply, I can live with it. So used to being wrong, being wrong one more time didn't make any difference. The guy had paid his bill. What was the problem? <laughs> and so the editor of Science News wrote that up under the interesting title, Lucy, the trouble with dating an older woman. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Well, out in San Diego, we had the trouble with dating an older man. There was a skull found in the cliffs above San Diego called Del Mar Man, and a scientist who invented a hot new method of dating, amino acid racemization, uh, said this skull must be 40,000 years old, older than many evolutionists thought man had been in that part of the country. But he had calibrated his method next to carbon-14. Nobody told him carbon-14 needed to be corrected. <laughs> so when he revised his dating method, Delmar Mann went from being uh, uh, 40,000 years old to 5,000 years old. And the newsman that wrote up the article quipped, if Delmar Mann gets any younger, we're going to have to call on the homicide squad. <laughs> 
so there's a little problem with taking these dates literally. Well, now, where can you find this information? Do you have to come to a creation conference in order to find out this? This is a good place. Uh, there's a real nice readable book for laymen by Dr. Paul Ackerman. It's a young world after all that goes through some of these things. John Morris is working on a more technical book right now but you can go right to the evolutionist. This is a page from a textbook written by an evolutionist for evolutionists at one of the most prestigious scientific universities in the world. But he's an evolutionist who believes in being honest with the evidence. And so he goes through all the problems in, in radioactive decay dating methods, not knowing how much you had to start with, not knowing full well that the system isn't closed and so on, that things have been added and subtracted, not knowing what the radioactive decay might have been like or how it would be affected by extinct radiation and so on. And so he says, it is obvious, I would just change that to it should be obvious, that radiometric techniques may not be the absolute dating methods they're claimed to be. Age estimates on a given stratum by different methods are often quite different. Okay, not rarely, not the exception, but often quite different. How different? One or two percent? Ten or twenty percent? No. Sometimes by hundreds of millions of years. 99.9999999% error. If you ask a scientist, can we use radioactive decay to date things, a scientist would have to say, no, I know too much about the method. I know too many problems. There's no way we can use this as a dating method. And that's what he concludes. There is no absolutely reliable long-term radiologic clock. The good news is he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just point out the problems in, in an, even though he believes in an old universe, he has to believe what he says in spite of this evidence. But then he goes on and lists about a dozen different evidences of a young Earth. The amount of helium in the atmosphere is nowhere near what it should be if radioactive decay had been going on for billions of years. This lecture should be brought to you in a high squeaky voice like this because of all the helium in the room. <laughs> but it isn't that way at all. <laughs> And so on. In fact, helium is being added to the atmosphere by capture from solar radiation and so on. Oil pressure. The pressure in oil wells is so great that if it had been down underground for even 200,000 years, it would be all gone. There's a lot of it left. A lot of it's in the wrong place politically, <laughs> but there's a lot of it left and so on. Yet it would all be gone if the earth were even 200,000 years old. My favorite, though, is carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 itself, it just has a short half-life, 5,730 years, but it may have a lot to say about the age of things. Interestingly enough, there's only enough carbon-14 in the atmosphere for an Earth less than 20,000 years old, in fact, a lot closer to 10. Carbon-14 is continually built up in the atmosphere by high energy bombardment of nitrogen-14, then leaked out by radioactive decay. Well, what's uh, Stansfield going to say about this? What's the evolutionist going to say about this in his textbook? Well, number one, he says the creationists are right about the evidence. Carbon-14 is out of balance. There's not enough of it there. If the Earth were even 30,000 years old, it ought to have reached the balance point, and it hasn't. And so he starts off by saying, number one, the creationists are right about the facts. It hasn't reached its equilibrium point yet. And they draw a logical conclusion. The Earth's atmosphere must be less than 20,000 years old. But keep in mind, he still believes in evolution. He still believes in great age. And so here's how he tries to get around it. It's possible that a greater concentration of water vapor existed. Hmm, interesting idea. Water vapor canopy, huh? <laughs> you may have heard of that before from creationists. When was there more water vapor in the atmosphere? Here's an evolutionist textbook. Prior to the, can you read those little words? Biblical flood with a capital B right in the middle of an evolution text. When was that biblical flood? Presumably about 5,000 years ago, better dating than many theologians. <laughs> so here's an evolutionist in a textbook that says, I know why the carbon-14 is out of balance. It's the biblical flood 5,000 years ago that shook up the Earth's atmosphere. What do I say? Amen, right on, brother, sounds good to me. <laughs> And so just at a time when many Christians are afraid, and I think for a lot of Christians, it was kind of like me becoming a creationist. It was sort of like surrendering my intellectual respectability. And that's kind of hard for people to do and so on. But boy, compared with knowing Christ, you know, it's nothing. <laughs> but at any rate, that may be one of the problems. But as we looked at it this way, even an evolutionist recognizes 
uh, the evidence, uh, the problems there are with the old age dating, the evidences there are of a young earth. Well, in that class that I thought would make it most difficult to just accept the Bible as God wrote it, when we're going over the end of all this radioactive decay dating, the prof just says, we're going through a list of assumptions. Our last assignment was to list all the assumptions you have to make before you can even begin to date a rock using radioactivity. So we're going through this long list of assumptions. I made 14 assumptions on my list. And the prof just stopped in the middle of all this. He kind of chuckled. He said, you know, if a Bible-believing Christian ever got hold of all this information, he'd make havoc out of the dating system. So he smiled one more time and said, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Ah, oh, I nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> I thought if it was a matter of keeping faith, I had another faith. I'd really rather keep. <laughs> and at bottom, when you, when you think about it, evolution is just a faith. It's a faith based on the words of men who weren't there, the words of men who don't know everything, the words of men who make lots of mistakes, and so on. Evolution is a faith the facts have failed. It's just so plain. And what's that alternative? When we take a look at the Bible, the Bible's a faith too. It's trust in God's word. That God really did say what he means and meant what he said. But what's that? That's a faith that fits the facts. And we're right back to Psalm 19 in Romans 1, just like we read in those passages there. What we see in God's world as we study science makes it easy to believe what we read in the Bible about creation, fall, flood, and redemption. Hard to believe what we're taught about evolution. So that's kind of the, the uh, testimony that I'd like to share with you this evening or this afternoon that uh, you know, that's how the Lord changed my life in leading me away from evolution, away from something that would have ended in death, you know, to life eternal in fellowship with Him. And the good news is it's not just my testimony. All over the world, we have scientists making the same testimony. Some of you have had the privilege of hearing Dr. Uh, Dmitry Kuznetsov from the Soviet Union, leader of the Moscow Creation Fellowship. We've had him at our college, and I've, I've been in conference with him. Tremendous uh, individual uh, in all kinds of academic credentials and so on, and also a humble Christian, grateful for the Lord, way the Lord has changed his life. Uh, a couple of summers ago, my wife and I spent uh, three weeks in Japan with the uh, Creation Science Foundation there, headed up by Dr. Usami, who was a 17-year-old uh, man, was, was looking into the Bible to convince his brother not to become a Christian. Wound up becoming a Christian himself and committing his life to the Lord at that early age. And what a testimony he has. And as we went around Japan, it was so thrilling to be able to share with the Japanese that we're talking about the real God, not the God of Western culture, not the American God, and not the Caucasian God or something like that, but the real God, the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth, the God of all peoples in all times and all places. And the list just goes on and on. Uh, Professor Dean Kenyon at San Francisco State University taught evolution, wrote a book uh, on chemical evolution. That was his area of expertise. Some students came up, 1 Peter 3.15. They said, hey, are we going to hear anything about creation in this course? And Dean Kenyon said, well, uh, some people believe God created it. I guess that's the creation site. They said, oh, no, there's so much more. Here, read these books. Tell us what you think. And then they kept coming back, two key words, politely, persistently, ready to give a reason for their hope, yet in gentleness and meekness. Have you read these books? What do you think about it? Well, I haven't read them yet, you know. And finally, Dr. Kenyon said, I resolved one weekend to read these books, refute them, and be done with it. He said, I read them, and I couldn't refute them. Same thing for him as for me over a three-year period. He finally changed his thinking completely from being a, an evolutionist to being a creationist and being a Christian, dedicating his life to Christ. He's one of the co-authors of the book out there of Pandas and People and so on. Here's another list of some of the other scientists right around the world whose testimony is the same as mine. Changed lives. That's what the creation ministry is all about. Changed lives. And if God can change Dmitry Kuznetsov after all those years of brainwashing and Marxism, if he can change me, which is probably even worse, you know, an American just looking for the good life. That's a real hard nut to crack. <laughs> if he can change us, he can change your friends 
members of your family, your neighbors, and so on. Praise God, he changed me.